the web transport protocol is slowly becoming a reality. Chrome has released support for it um, around a year, is at least experimental support for it. And Firefox version 114 just a few days ago actually enabled support for the web transport protocol. Despite this protocol and spec is not being finalized yet, it's still in draft mode. That means there isn't even a number for it. There is no RFC, official RFC number for it. It's just in draft mode. So in this uh, video slash podcast, I'd I like to talk about what is this web transport protocol? Um, what features does it have? What is it going to, why do we need another protocol? Right? What is it really? So if you're interested, stay tuned. It's important to start with the basics. You know, the web has been built as the standard for anything that shares web pages and documents and anything on the web. And HTTP was built for that. And it is simply designed for a simple request response. So always the client initiate the request, never the server. You know? The server sits there, waits for a request, and it gives a response. But then we wanted more interactivity from the server. We came up with a lot of tricks, the idea of long polling such that, okay, I'm going to send you a request and just stream uh, the results whenever you have the response. It doesn't, you don't, don't immediately respond to me. Hold that request until you actually have the response. We came up with another trick, server sent events, which is also another cool idea where we send another one request, but the response is infinite. It doesn't end, right? And we use transfer chunk encoding for that and, uh, and a specific content type to say, yeah, event stream. So it's like, let's just send data, send data. It's like sending a request, but an infinite response. It's a sort of response that, that doesn't end. And we use that to chunk those response into logical frames that we uh, interpret in the client as quote-unquote events brilliant brilliant pattern you know but still we also needed a bi-directional communication you know which http doesn't provide it's a request response the server cannot just send us things like that well you can still use these two techniques to build a bi-directional communication it's not really it's not intuitive, no? That's why the WebSockets protocol was designed. WebSockets was designed as a bi-directional communication. It's a really simple thing on top of HTTP. And what what we really what we did was really upgraded the connection that we used for HTTP and we used it as a raw uh medium to send data back and forth. Of course, the WebSocket has its own overhead, right? Such as uh, it has the idea of frames, its own concept of frames, and that frames has certain headers. So there is an overhead that you didn't have before, right? When you use the WebSocket protocol, it's not much. It's like around 14 bytes, 10 bytes per frame. And the other thing is the WebSocket protocol is uses certain things that are just weird you know that these are predates the tls you know because websockets was a, built in 2011 right even before that so tls was not a thing back then it was but it's not as dominant so they had this idea called masking which you have to do and it's cryptography cryptographic information to avoid cache poisoning for proxies which is basically non-existent problem with you as tls you know, because if you're encrypting things, then you have an encrypted channel. Nobody can change anything and nobody can, uh, you know, intercept that. So masking and all this idea of unnecessary overhead of the client and the server pair frame, that just adds unnecessary things, you know? So there's like a little bit of overhead plus over uh, WebSocket must be on top of TCP, which because HTTP one and two is on top of TCP, right? So there's like certain limitations for WebSockets that, well, great. Of course, we use it all the time. There's still something missing. Yeah? What the, of course, the, the HTTP protocol itself was evolved 
you know http2 was it was invented to allow for the idea of streams right uh so instead of just having a tcp connection to the server and you send one request and you wait for that server you almost serialize all the requests in one connection what you do is you segment that connection into streams and you tag uh, everything you send with specific frames the idea of frames was invented also in um in http2 right so each the, there's this kinds of frames and the frames will have an associated stream id with it so this way i can send technically any number of requests at the same time concurrently in the same connection and because each are uniquely identified each they have their own lane sort of speak regardless WebSocket, HTTP2, HTTP3 solved many problems. I talk about all of this stuff in my backend engineering course. Shameless plug. Head to backend.hussainnazar.com. Learn about all these patterns and protocols in details. But then the Web Transport Protocol, they kind of came in to solve a diverse set of problems. It want, it want to introduce flexibility to the user. And... I suppose this was maybe introduced by gRPC, you know, from Google. gRPC came in and built itself its own protocol on top of HTTP2, such that it can use a stream, same thing, you have one connection, but multiple streams. So you can create a unidirectional stream. You can create a bidirectional stream. So this stream is just a unidirectional, that means it's a request response, right? This stream is bidirectional. That means the server can send data, the client can send data, and so on, right? But they built it on top of HTTP2, and it's a very popular protocol. It's language agnostic. Is that the right thing to say? I suppose. Because they, they support many languages. You can use protocol buffer. So anything that supports protocol buffer, if your language supports protocol buffer, then you got gRPC, right? So and has support. So I became popular, right? gRPC doesn't work on the web, despite anyone who tells you it does. It does not. You have to use all these weird proxies and stuff like that, but it's not natively supported in the web. And the reason is because gRPC needs access to these low-level streams. It needs to manipulate the streams. It needs to, you know, have low-level access to the HTTP2 API, which the web doesn't give you you don't even get access to the raw tcp connection or in case of http 3 the raw quick connection you don't get access to that you have apis you send a request you read a stream of a response and the browser takes care of which stream whether it creates a new stream for you whether it creates a new connection it all does that by itself you know? So as a developer writing JavaScript in the client side, you have no control over that. And that's why gRPC cannot be built natively in the browser. The web transport protocol actually does all of that for you. Okay? So you can create a web transport session. In that web transport session, if the server supports web transport, it will allow you either the server or the client to create a stream that is bidirectional, that is uh, unidirectional, or get this, unreliable. I just want a stream of unreliable data. I want UDP. I want UDP on my browser. Hmm? Can I have UDP on my browser? We never had that feature. Well, take that back. WebRTC, remember that thing? No? WebRTC is kind of UDP, right? So that's that's the only UDP source that <laughs> the web developer has had, you know, to 
that anything resembles UDP. With Web Transport, you can actually create a new stream as a client or the server. The server can initiate their own streams as well and says, hey, I want uh, bidirectional. I want directional. I want unidirectional. I want datagram. I just want UDP. UDP is wrong. It's called, literally, it's called HTTP datagram, right? And I want that stream to be unreliable. Don't try to order the packets, whatever there, whatever I send, it's an audio or a video, or whatever. And I want it to arrive wh whatever the net decides. My, if the internet decides to reach our order, let it arrive our order. I will deal with the out of order packets, frames in this case, and I'll, I'll deal with them as an application. I know what I'm doing. I'm an application developer. If I receive something that I know is out of, out of order, I'll deal with it. Maybe I'll just show it to the user if it's a part of video. Maybe I'll skip a frame. Maybe I'll buffer and wait for the order. So you have no idea, guys, how powerful control is for application developers. Never, ever give up control. Control and the flexibility to have the power to control these things is priceless. Having magic box that does everything for you and you have absolutely no idea what it's doing and you have no control over what it's doing is a nightmare for developers. You see, that's why Postgres gives you a thousand knob and a thousand tuning parameter because they know the software databases are complex. That is why Web Transport is technically available, as far as I know, in two flavors. Web Transport over HTTP2, there is a draft for that, and there is a Web Transport over HTTP3. And surprisingly, they are very different. Naturally speaking, Web Transport doesn't really make sense on HTTP1 because it doesn't have the idea of streams. So there is no web transport for HTTP 1. You know, if you want that, just use web sockets. No? HTTP 2, on the other hand, uh, will give you the ability for bidirectional. You can create a bidirectional. You can create directional, but there is no unreliable uh, datagrams for web transport on top of HTTP2, naturally speaking, because HTTP2 is on top of TCP. You have to go order. That is the one main reason why HTTP3 was invented, right? To solve the head of line blocking problem that is available in HTTP2, right? I don't see why not, but you can proxy web transport, right? You can terminate TLS. You can understand those frames. God, is going to be difficult, but I didn't see any proxy support web transport yet. Right? Add a layer seven. Because add a layer four is easy. Just, just bleh. I just, just that that whole anything you send goes to the upstream server, right? But as a layer seven, you terminate, you understand how to read them, and you forward those frames to the dedicated server. But yeah, web transport, guys. If you're on top of HTTP3, you have all the beautiful things. You get bi-directional, unidirectional, and unreliable delivery right? right in your app. Check out the member-only version of this episode where I go into more details about the connect method, the extended connect method, the proxying, and how the kernel handles web transport, and uh, other things that I cut from this uh, public episode. I usually make the public episode a little bit shorter, and uh, uh, the longer form content, I put it as a member-only section. Uh, it supports the channel, and uh, there are over 60 member-only content uh, videos, and you get a lot of perks. Uh, check out the member-only content. Become a member now. Thank you.